So welcome to this morning's talk. Uh, it's on elusive or elusive. It's a bit of a cryptic heading to something that we recently sort of spoke about in one of the ward rounds at Red Cross Children's Hospital. Basically, elusive is a word that use, is used to depict a feeling of, you know, deceit or illusion in the best case. And elusive seems to sort of um, allude to the fact that something cannot be put or caught or put under control. And that's what I sort of feel this common um, sort of presentation or common diagnosis in the pediatric children, especially pediatric urology sits at. Um, I'll try and see if you guys agree with me, but we can make a start. So I'll start with a clinical scenario. So this is a six-year-old girl who presents with a febrile, uh, an episode of febrile UTI at the age of one year and she had bilateral grade three viscoureteric reflux. She was soon started on continuous antibiotic prophylaxis and she's now been seen by you years after that. Um, so she's currently having no bladder bowel dysfunction. She doesn't have any renal scars, no urinary tract infection since, and she's been off the continuous antibiotic prophylaxis for about two years. She's had recent imaging, um, which showed bilateral grade three viscoureteric reflux. So the parents have now moved to your city and they want an opinion and further care for this child. Um, luckily, in your area, you've got uh, big shots. So you've got uh, Dr. Hoberman, who's a pediatrician, and he sort of had, well, he was one of the principals in the RIVA trial that was checking antibiotics and vescoeuretic reflux. And he says, you know, give the child antibiotics. I'm studying casting doubt on antibiotics were underpowered, and the RIVA trial would answer that. And then there's a Dr. Linda Shotley, who's a pediatric urologist. And surprisingly, she also sits on the American Pediatric Association UTI Guidelines Committee. And she says, offer the child surgery, fix it now, fix it later, it's your choice. And last but not least, uh, you've got a pediatric nephrologist who says, manage this patient conservatively. If she gets an infection, then fix it. I'm going to start a poll here and see what you people think. What would you offer? Um, it, there's no wrong or right answer, just to see if you were presented with such a scenario in your clinic, what would you tell the parents to this child? Would you tell them surgery? Would you tell them antibiotics? Would you give them uh, conservative management? So I don't know if we can put up the poll. Uh, can you see the poll? Uh, not yet. Not yet. All right. There we go. Thanks, Sam. So I'll give you a few seconds. It's an anonymous poll, so, and as I said, there's no right or wrong answer. We can all choose what you would personally offer these parents to this child. It's an option A, which is give the child continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. Option B, which is offer surgical treatment for this condition. So she's got bilateral grade three severe viscoeuretic reflux or manage this conservatively because she's not had any infections in the past two years and she's been off the continuous antibiotic prophylaxis with no bowel, bladder bowel dysfunction, no renal scars, and she's basically healthy and going well. Yeah, I see you guys are still voting, but I think uh, it's with one minute now. Okay, can you see the poll? Up uh, not yet. I mean, can you see the poll? Yeah, I could see the poll and I, I, I put in an option so that were maybe people are just a bit shy in answering the question then. Yeah, no. Um, it looks like option three is the one that the highest votes. Awesome. Which is it? Uh, Sixty-seven percent guys think they would uh, uh, conservative, and uh, and uh, option B is nineteen percent, and option A, uh, uh, continuous antibiotics, is fifteen percent. So I think guys will really mostly go for option C, which is conservative. If she gets infections, then fix it. Thanks, Sam. So yeah, so this is um, just you know, go to the next slide. I don't know why there's a problem today. Okay, there we go. 
Um, so this is actually a clinical decision question that was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011, and it was the same scenario that I presented. It was an online poll with participants from 82 countries, and they had 1,073 responses. And again, you can see the South African cohort seems to think similar to the worldwide cohort, which is good, in that most of the people who responded would actually sort of logically give observation alone, and if the child deteriorated or had UTIs, then act on it. And then the second most common choice was the freedom of choice, which is offer surgery. And if the parents wish to have surgery, they can get surgery. The last is a scientific discovery and um, nobody was really keen on offering long-term antibiotics for this patient. Um, this is an interesting article that I thought maybe would just spark a bit of, you know, interest in the topic. And it's a editorial on vesicoliotic reflux. It's quite old written by one of the urologists in 1981. But even at that time, he was sort of mentioning that in the last 30 years of reflux history, it's ironic that urologists become so expert at its surgical correction before understanding much of its natural history and its true clinical significance. I feel like this sort of, um, you know, relates to seeing a patient with UTI and you see vesicoureteric reflux. Most of the people with knee-jerk experience would be to go and, you know, do something about the reflux. So the case in presentation now, the one we were seeing at Red Cross Children's Hospital is actually a eight year old girl, MC. Um, she had end stage renal disease, secondary to congenital nephrotic syndrome, the Finnish type, which is a bit rare. And she was on peritoneal dialysis prior to transplant. She ended up having a cadaveric renal transplant in September, 2015, and her natis, native kidneys were not removed. She then had acute rejection in November, 2015, and she was passed three times with steroids. She's also got complex febrile seizures. She's asthmatic. And post-transplant, she developed lymphoproliferative disorder that was proven on, on biopsy. And she subsequently had an adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy in October 2016. She is on a whole list of medications, um, as sort of shown on your side there. So I'm just going to present her story in form of a timeline. So the first event we will start is with the Kedavari Greeno transplant that was in September 2015. And soon after that, there is a sort of key, but the red um, sort of marker there is for ESBL organisms. The blue marker marks sensitive organisms. And then the green ones are what, in terms of UTI, she had mixed growth or an enterococcus, which wasn't a very specific sort of uh, finding. So this child then had multiple urinary tract infections after her transplant. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much of history before the transplant in terms of UTIs and um, the file seems to have been lost before that. Um, but as you can see, she had multiple recurrent UTIs and therefore in July 2017, she had workup done for this recurrent UTIs and a maturating sister urethrogram was done which showed reflux into the graft. She subsequently had a sting procedure which basically involves endoscopic injection of a dexonoma polymer into the subureteric space as shown there, so that it sort of obliterates the ureteric orifice and allows the reflux to sort of be managed endoscopically in this case. So we hope that, you know, after this, the child would have been sorted out and no new problems, but unfortunately, she kept having recurrent UTIs, and they're quite multiple and quite frequent now. And in May 2018, she had another ESPL organism, which sort of prompted us to work her further so she had a repeat micturating cystic urethrogram at that stage, and she was found to have, I would call this a grade one reflux on the right side. She subsequently was offered a ureteric re-implant, and we, under, we offered her the lish Gregoire re-implant, which is a common re-implant done in our setup. And she had the advantages of this re-implant is that the bladder is not open, the decreased post-operative hematuria and bladder spasms. However, one disadvantage which wouldn't apply to her case was that there is an increased risk of urinary retention due to damage of pelvic nerves, especially in bilateral repairs. There are other options of non-refluxing ureteric cream plants. The palutano led better is the more preferred option, but then people do use the Cohen, Cohen cross-trigonal cross ream plants as well. Um, the only issue is that these are intravesical sort of approaches and therefore the, you usually have to open up the bladder, bladder to make the repair. Um, 
Following up on this child, she now seems to have more ESBL organism UTIs compared to sensitive UTIs. And therefore in August, 2018, we were a bit worried about this child and therefore had a battery of tests run again for her. And she had a KUB ultrasound showing no hydronephrosis. She had a video urodynamic study showing a normal capacity, good compliance bladder. There was no vesicourotate refluxing at that stage. There was no leakage, no uninhibited contractions. And she was emptying her bladder completely she had a renogram done that showed no cortical defects, some degree of chronic rejection with prolonged cortical activity and gradual decrease in pelvic activity in keeping with um, sort of drainage of that kidney. She was, however, noted to be constipated and she was started on treatment for that at that stage. We hope that, you know, this sort of should have solved her problems, but then she kept getting UTIs again. And in July, 2020, um, we sort of saw her. So the part about the infection, she was treated, they were less frequent than, you know, the ones she had, but she had like two ESPL infections. However, I've noticed that the period of from January, 2020 to around July, she had no infections. You can sort of say that this is the COVID period, but she was seen by the Reno team regularly. And therefore, in, so these were all symptomatic presentations. There weren't dipstick infections or actually febrile presentations, the child not feeling well, nausea, vomiting, coming to the hospital through the emergency unit sort of picture. Um, but in July 2020 on renal follow-up, she had deteriorating renal function. Her GFR had now dropped from 16 March 2019 to 43 in June 2020. And therefore, they wanted a renal biopsy to see if there was changes in that transplant kidney. What it showed was that there was interstitial fibrosis with tubular atrophy and there was features of chronic pyelonephritis. She, however, for some reason did not have any infections in January to December 2020. And in Jan 2021, she's now presented with multiple ESPL infections. So she's had a reworkup done. Her ultrasound does show that there is a bit of hydronephrosis and we thought she had reflux, but doing a micturating cystoerythrogram again did not show much reflux going on. However, what we could see at the end after she managed to avoid was that there was significant vaginal reflux. So she was probably having a vaginal uh, voiding as well. And it was in keeping with the symptoms the mother was complaining of that this child was wet and she was now wearing nappies. So in summary, the, these are the two timelines of her UTIs and you can see they're quite um, drastic from sensitive organism to now starting to grow ESPL organisms. And they are in number about 24 to 25 episodes she's had since the transplant in 2015. And the bottom diagram sort of differentiates the different organisms. And the recurrent feature was the one that's I sort of put up in red and those are all E. coli UTIs. Um, of note is that the sensitivities of all these E. coli UTIs were quite different. So they weren't reinfection or an element of persistent infection that you'd think about. So talking about vesicourotate reflux, um, it is the retrograde flow of urine from the bladder to the upper tract, and it basically hinges on the integrity of the anti-reflux mechanism. And this has to be a balance between the anatomic and functional relationships between the bladder and the ureter. And generally, in day-to-day -day practice, we use the international classification of the vesicourotate reflux, which create grades reflux into five different categories, where one is just a wisp of contrast up the ureter, two, you can sort of see the collecting system, three, there is prominence of the collecting system, um, four, there's prominence of the pelvis, and five is blunted sort of club calices and a dilated tortuous ureter. It's not a very efficient system of classifying. Um, there was a study done that showed, sort of showed that 28% of the, you know, sort of 28% um, of the radiologists will not agree on the, the reflux grade between two and four. Each of them will have their own idea of what it is. And it's probably this is the place where most of the decisions in terms of take reflux will sort of make a difference whether you'd want to operate surgically or not. And then just to touch on urinary tract infections, you can do, um, sort of broadly classify them into complicated or uncomplicated UTIs. So to classify one into uncomplicated UTIs, you'd have a patient who's got no anatomical or functional uh, problems with the urinary tract system and 
in a lady, she should not be pregnant. And those would then sort of broadly classify you to have an uncomplicated UTI. Uh, recurrent UTIs are sort of um, more than three urinary tract infections in a year or two episodes of urinary tract infections in six months. And then recurrent UTIs can be then classified into different categories. That's unresolved infections where once you give an appropriate antibiotics, you repeat the urine MCNS and if there is still persistence of the same infection that you classify as an unresolved infection. And then if you're calling it recurrent urinary tract infections, you need to figure out whether they're reinfections or put bacterial persistence. So the reinfection would mean that once you've treated adequately, you repeat the urine MCNS and you should have a negative culture. And if you have a repeat culture that's positive, that's reinfection. And this bacterial persistence sort of hinges on the fact or that there is a nidus of infection, be it an indwelling stent, be it problems, um, be it a diverticulum, and sometimes even reflux, which is the case in point here. However, I'd like you to draw your attention to this um, pie chart here, which basically sort of says that viscoureteric reflux is just one of the multiple contributors to you know, tract infections in children, and therefore you can just blame one you know, segment of the problem and try and address that if you haven't addressed other things. So when you see a child with urinary tract infections, you should always sort of have, you know, in your mind, are there anatomic anomalies? Is there antibiotic resistance? Is there renal scarring? In terms of male foreskin, you know, offering circumcision, which is sort of debatable, but can help stop UTIs. And the American colleagues seem to be highly sort of, you know, a good proponents of that uh, practice. You also need to keep in um, in your head about bladder bowel dysfunction and voiding dysfunction, especially in children, and the age at presentation and the number of UTIs and types of UTIs this child is getting. Are they the common E. coli, you know, variety or the atypical organism? And then lastly, you also need to sort of just give an idea about genetics. And there are some people who are more susceptible to urinary tract infections than others. Um, so this is just a paper, and the, it was one of the good questions, is that is vesicoreotic reflux an important find? And the answer is no, with some exceptions. And the authors to this paper sort of divided vesicoreotic reflux disease patient or patients with vesicoreotic reflux into two types or two categories. One was the disease category and one was a symptom. As you can imagine, most of the patients will be the symptom patients and very few will be the disease patient that would require intervention. And the disease patient, according to them, would have, you know, would be a male child, commonest age of presentation at newborn or infancy. They would have renal palancano abnormalities, dilated urinary tract symptom because of, you know, grade four to five reflux. And the chances of them having a spontaneous resolution within the first years of life would be very low compared to the symptom um, group, which is 80 to 90, which probably doesn't need surgical intervention for. And possible ethiopathogenesis would be abnormal vesicoureteric junction compared to the others where you'd see bladder dysfunction and maybe some of them can be managed um, sort of conservatively. So as I said, frequency of the disease category would be rare. And the proponent was that not every child needs intervention. So there was no evidence that detection of the lesser grade of vesicoureteric reflux is warranted. Outcomes of high-grade dilatating vesicoreotic reflux detected early in life with dysplastic poorly functioning kidney is the one that remains a concern. However, they did conclude that prospective studies are needed and it's unknown whether in the interventions to address vesicoreotic reflux will prevent or retard progression of chronic kidney disease. This is an article from last year in April 2020. So moving on, this is where I was sort of basing my talk on, is how do you approach vesicoureteric reflux in the setting of pediatric renal transplants? And this is a very special cohort of patients. So I started by looking at our own local data. And this is actually an article from Red Cross Children's Hospital written by the different team that's involved in renal transplants and amongst our children at Red Cross, that's the renal team us, the urologists, the general surgeons or pediatric surgeons. And this was by one of the fellows from the urology department who was doing his fellowship in pediatric urology. So they had a retrospective folder study done between January 1996 to December 2014. 
and we had 160 renal transplants in 146 patients. Out of that, we had 32 complications. That sits at about a rate of 18, which is in keeping with global rates from complications. And of the 32 complications, we had 17 vesicoureteric refluxes, six anastomotic leaks, and six ureteric strictures. In the patients who had the vesicoureteric reflux, the initial, re the initial implant of that transplant, 13 of them were refluxing type. And that's likely from the previous um, sort of the older cohort. And then as around December 2014 is where we changed our practice and started doing the modified Lishkagwa implant in our renal transplant. And therefore four of those had the modified Lishkagwa trans um, sort of implant in the kidney. It is important to note that the reason why we had diagnosed the vesicoureteric reflux is that these patients all had recurrent UTIs. But you can also see that in our cohort, most were managed conservatively and six had re-implants and three had endoscopic management. And then the other complications were anastomotic leaks and ureteric strictures. So when does a patient with vesicoureteric reflux, reflux in pediatric kidney transplant need treatment? This is again another study um, from the US, in, which was written in September 2018. It was a retrospective study again between 2006 and 2016 with at least six months of follow-up for each of their patients. And then 319 patients enrolled who majority had a leash gregoire technique done in the initial implant and the DJ stent was placed at transplantation. Um, the indication for doing or working of these patients with a mixture in history erythrogram was whether that the patient had hydronephrosis on follow-up, had recurrent febrile UTIs or an allograft biopsy as per protocol to diagnose subclinical scarring was done and the histology ended up showing renal scarring suggestive of infections. Um, so 18 patients, that's about 6% six patient, six had vesicoureteric re reflux into the transplant kidneys. And this is a good sort of, I, I find, you know, approach to a patient who had sort of recurrent UTIs and, you know, or any of the other reasons. And they sort of had this protocolized approach to the management of this patient in that they first worked up the patient for bladder bowel dysfunction and they did a urodynamic study. If they found any problems, they initiated bladder training and antibiotic prophylaxis. Remember, this was a study done in 2018. In this current day, antibiotic prophylaxis would be something that would be debatable. And then after the bladder training was in sort of done, you know, the antibiotics were stopped and after the bladder problems were corrected, and if the patient ended up having, you know, urinary tract infections after this, they offered the child a deflux in injection with a double heat technique. And they would then monitor, observe the patient. And if they still had recurrent UTIs or had another febrile UTI, they would offer the child open cross, uh, Cohen's cross trigonal re implant. This is because their first implant was a Leish Gregoire um, implant. And if after doing all this, the child still had urinary tract infections, they then went into antibiotic prophylaxis for a long period. And so I'm sorry for this, but these are the different categories of patients they had. They had the patients with hydronephrosis, the recurrent UTIs and the abnormal renal biopsies. And the patients with the hydronephrosis, they were managed basically with the bladder training and antibiotic prophylaxis. The ones with the recurrent UTI, only one was successfully managed with bladder training. The other eight of them from the nine patients ended up having an endoscopic management with the dexoma polymer. And of the eight, four required ureteric re -implants. And then the ones with the abnormal renal biopsy, three were managed with bladder training, and one ended up requiring ureteral re-implantation after the endoscopic management. So of the five with the hydronephrosis, two resolved, three were not assessed. The group with the recurrent UTI, the eight who had the endoscopic management, two had the resolution of vesicoreotic reflux. And out of the four that had reimplantation, one had resolution when one of them was not assessed. And then the group that had normal renal biopsy, one out of one had resolution in the vesicoreotic reflux. So of note is the complications with the endoscopic management in that they had four patients they had managed with endoscopic management and one had loss of graft out of the eight patients, sorry, and three of them had obstruction and these are the four that required reimplantation. implantation. 
Um, did the UTI result is a good question. So the groups with abnormal endohydronephrosis had none at baseline and only two had successful management of their UTI after all that. And therefore, they could only manage to get two off antibiotics. The rest of them were on antibiotic prophylaxis. This is an interesting graph from the same study that was sort of measuring the GFR of these children with the different problems over a period of two years. And they concluded that there's no difference in the GFR between patients with febrile UTIs and those without at two year follow up. So it was an underpowered study with 98 and there was some that had complicating factor of acute rejection, which would then affect the patient's um, GFR rate. Then hinging on or borrowing from the previous study and their problems with the endoscopic anti-reflux, this is another important question to ask oneself is that is endoscopic anti-reflux surgery leading to obstruction in pediatric renal transplant patients? And this is a bit of an old, um, study from or article from 2016 but it was a retrospective study from 2001 to 2013 in three institutions in the in the united states and 17 pediatric patients underwent the endoscopic management within this period and out of that they had four patients who had obstruction of the transplant kidneys and the technique that they used was a sting which they gave between 1.6 to 3 moles of deflux and they also noted that obstruction did not necessarily occur in the acute phase and some of them actually had obstruction several years out after the endoscopic management and therefore they sort of suggested a long-term surveillance even though you've done endoscopic management and this is one of the tables they had in their article again which i found interesting so the top ones are all the sort of adult population but the last two studies are the, in the pediatric population and this is in the group of you know, transplant ureters and you can see that they also had endoscopic management for about 19 patients in total. And in compared to the normal native ureter management of, you know, vascoeuretic reflux, where there is about 87%, you know, success rate, you can see that the success rate in the transplant um, population is quite low. It only hinges to about 50% rate. This is basically because of the anatomy of the transplant it's not in an area there's usually a wide opening and you sort of have to give um, the deflux circumferentially um, so then the other thing that you know we'd want to know is um, the anastomotic techniques of transplantation or how you implant the ureter into the bladder would that make a difference in terms of having you know reflux or other complications. So this is actually a systematic review and a meta-analysis of the different anastomotic techniques. And of note is that they had you know, multiple studies. They had about 25 studies of this, but what I would like to draw your attention from this is that most of the studies were cohort studies and they only actually had two studies that were randomized control studies. And if you look at the quality score, which is basically what you would do for any study that you're presenting, on the, in terms of doing the systematic review, you sort of figure out if there's a bias or no bias and you know, other outcomes. And you can see that this study scored very poorly in that aspect. And uh, lishka gua significantly lowers the risk of ureteral leakage compared to palutano lead better. And there's no difference in the prevalence of strictures and vascoeuretic reflux between the different techniques. However, as I said, this was a cohort study and maybe more randomized control studies need to be done to sort of um, say on that. So in the end, when we come back to our patient, there is what I would say, you know, in terms of going forward with her is that we have to look to the broader picture of um, things and the vascoeuretic reflux is probably not the only problem, though she doesn't have any reflux at the moment and this other, you know, components to the chart need to be addressed. She is booked for a urodynamic study again and a renogram to figure out and she has been started on, you know, sort of urotherapy to address her vaginal reflux. And then the last thing I'd like to say is that the management of vascoeuretic reflux is sort of a Newton scraddle where your pendulum can swing anywhere between um, open surgery to robotic surgery to endoscopic management to continuous antibiotic prophylaxis and in most of our patients we would generally just observe the patient 
So it's where your child sits at and what, what you think is best. And it's usually good to sort of approach this sort of cases via a multidisciplinary team and sort of have people look at the different aspects of that chart. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening my, to my talk. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Parvin, for such an, uh, an interesting and excellent talk. Just a question on my side. I just want to find out, so I probably missed that, but was this child uh, investigated for bladder function, any issues with voiding dysfunction? Because you're talking about vaginal voiding. Do you look at that, looking at the bladder? Um, yeah, Sam. So actually, she did have a, I'll go back to that slide. She actually had a, she had, she had a video urodynamic study done in 2018, looking at that and at that stage, we found that she had a normal capacity to good compliance bladder. There was no reflux, no leakage, and she was doing basically fine. So we had sort of addressed that. She was noted to be constipated back in 2018 and she was started on you know, bowel management therapy as well at that stage. Right, and I see like in your data presented in 2017 that most of uh, re-implants were done refluxing. Uh, and your data, 13 patients uh, were done refluxing in four, Lich Gregoire. Has that changed over years, or do you know if there's any, anything that's done? And the second question following that, if you would uh, transplant an adult kidney, uh, would you be managing your reflux differently? Because you know, in pediatric kidneys, you don't like reflux scarring, uh, proteinuria, hypertension, and renal failure. Yeah, Sam. Um, so that's probably... You know, like, I think I'd refer back to, I don't know if you want to mute yours or if there's a bit of an echo. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, so from this article, it actually sort of, you know, there are big questions being asked whether reflux nephropathy is actually a thing in itself. Um, and some people seem to think that by the time you're having a febrile UTI and having a reflux, vesicoyotic reflux, diagnosed you've already had the injury and the hit and there's nothing much and is some of the questions that people are looking into is whether doing something about it is does it really sort of you know help with the gfr or does it help retard or you know keep the gfr stable i think i came across an article done at red cross hospital again um, by peter norse and the reno team and my not have the clear details about it, but what I thought of the article was that they actually sort of did not think that there was much of a difference in terms of escoriotic reflux and um, renal dysfunction or GFR going off. There is actually no correlation between the two in some of the studies shown. Um, in an adult patient, uh, yeah, so it's a bit of a thing. I think offering you know deflux into that it might not might not be the right thing to do i'd say out of a you know re-implant for them and yeah i think we've changed tact and all the studies that i looked at nobody really talks about refluxing implants anymore most of the people who do are doing sort of non-refluxing however you do need to be cognizant of the fact that you do run a risk of, you know, having obstruction as one of the main problems when you're doing a transplant. And therefore there are multiple methods that the surgeons use, whether it's actually a proper, you know, lish re-implant or a bit of a loose stitch here and there. It's hard to say, but yeah, I, I think that's probably from surgeon to surgeon. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Ravin. Uh, uh, just last, a last comment from maybe any pediatric, uh, surgeon, urology surgeon in the country who would like to comment um, about how they approach uh, VUR in their centers. Can anyone uh, from the country just give us a comment on how they approach VUR? Any, any sort of urology consultant who, who deals with uh, pediatric urology? Yeah, Bevan, uh, um, well done on an excellent presentation. Um, and I think you highlighted one thing that we kind of maybe didn't first think about in this case, if you've got a patient with valves or neuropathic bladder, you really focus on the bladder bowel dysfunction. But if you've got a child who's not producing a lot of urine, bladder capacity can be small. I mean, you've done a, a, a least while re-implant, you can cause the trees overactivity. 
um, and if there is associated constipation, etc., one needs to address that. Um, and I think that was well highlighted here. Um, and I think in this case, though, it is probably the tip of the iceberg, the one patient who really did need fairly aggressive management of their reflux because the biopsy did demonstrate uh, that there was uh, chronic um, pyelonephritis um, in that kidney. Uh, so yes, there is a large volume of reflux, which is benign. Uh, but I think in a patient who receives a transplant, um, that kidney should ideally be starting off with no scarring. Um, and, and you want to prevent that in this unique scenario.